the difference between US and China is the autocrats in China are in the Communist Party and the autocrats in America are in Silicon Valley. Hello and welcome to Offscript. My name is Stephen Edgington. The world is changing. Wealth inequality is soaring. The cultural gap between the elites and the masses is widening and society seems more polarised than ever before. To talk about these transformations, I'm joined by the geographer and author, Joel Kotkin. Is the Enlightenment over? Wow, what a great question to start with. Well, I, would, I, I don't know if I would go as far as the Enlightenment, but I would say that the, because that may go, you know, there, there have been ups and downs since then, but certainly I think we're seeing the beginning of, of a postmodern era, which in a many ways parallels what we saw in the Middle Ages. Um, otherwise, this period in which there was more freedom, uh, more open expression, uh, lots of interesting ups and downs in the marketplace, um, and where the middle class and the working class did better, the working class getting into the middle class, the middle class, and as we would define it in the, the US, buying houses, or starting businesses, having jobs. And that whole scenario is beginning to fall apart. And, um, uh, you know, who knows where it's going to lead, but I think that the what, where we're moving is to something very different than the kind of liberal order that we have, that we've all grown up with. Now you say, who knows where is this going to lead? You've been writing about where this perhaps is going to end up. Um, you've written a book about neo-feudalism. What is that? Well, neo-feudalism is really, it's not that, you know, you're going to walk down, you know, High Street next week and there's going to be a bunch of guys with chain mail. I mean, that's not going to happen, you know, and, and you're not going to have damsels in distress everywhere. No, that's not what it is. It's a return to the fundamentals of feudalism, which is the concentration of power and, and ownership in few hands, the rise of a quasi-religious uh, orthodoxy, which does not allow other people to e express something outside of that, it, which is approved by the church, or in this case, the uh, by the sort of, if you will, the scientific and cultural oligarchy, <laughs> or what I like to also refer to as the clerisy, which uh, actually comes from Coleridge. Um, and then the, the, there is the, the future of very modest um, economic, even negative economic growth very, um, in the West and in China, uh, an enormous demographic collapse um, that's taking place. Um, the, the great parallel in many ways in terms of power arrangements is that at the end of the Roman Empire, when middle, the, the Dark Ages began, um, there was chaos, and and this and and though those people who had the physical power to assert themselves became the feudal lords. They it was by power that they were able to do it, sanctified by the church. What we're seeing today is that the digital revolution, which was launched by schmucks like me, the American taxpayer, um, if you want to put it that way, we um, we have completely changed our economic system. And of course, pandemic uh, accelerated this. Um, and that there was all this territory where you could take the digital application to, you know, whether it's taxi service or, or banking or, um, or obviously retail. And this group of people came in and like the, the barbarians, um, they came in, they took the territory. The old rulers, the old corporate establishment was too slow, too stupid to move quickly. And now this group, which I call the oligarchy, now has incredible control over almost everything in this economy. I mean, what, what astounds me is I, you know, you, you start your day, you, 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 uh, you know, you read a newspaper that's owned by Jeff Bezos or, or by some other oligarch, you, you know, you, um, you, you shop at, 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 at Amazon, you, you bank th through a fintech company. Um, it, when you think about outer space, it's going to be Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk there. Um, so this, in many cases, the same group of people, I mean, you now are getting to a point where I can see very easily here in the United States that within 10 years, 
there'll be 10 companies. They will control virtually everything that happens. And by the way, capitalism is not what they want. Capitalists, as, uh, as I believe uh, 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 Adam Smith made clear, they all naturally want a monopoly. We all want a monopoly. I and mean, wouldn't the Telegraph like it if it was the only newspaper in, in the UK? You'd make all sorts of money. And so what we're moving towards is also kind of this, this increasingly concentrated and controlled uh, economy and society. So you talk about a sort of hierarchy, don't you? You've mentioned two groups there, the sort of oligopolies, these tech companies who have immense power, and the kind of cultural and political elites uh, who, again, hold huge power over our society. And there's the third group, isn't there, that you also talk about, which is sort of the serfs and the, the middle class, working class. Can you describe what's happening to those people? Well, I break it down into two, into two groups, and, um, and I don't want to be over, you know, too detailed, but basically the yeomanry, which I define as the property-owning, uh, small business, the artisan, you know, the basis of, of democratic societies that emerged in the UK and the Netherlands, the United States, Australia, Canada in particular. Um, this group um, has gotten clobbered. Um, the tech companies have, have devastated High Street or Main Street, as we would call it here. It's, um, it's made it very, very difficult for new tech players to come up unless they're, they're backed by the same venture capitalists and private equity people who back the other ones. Um, and, and then what you have is many of them, and particularly their children, are becoming serfs. And by that, I mean, they don't own anything. Uh, they're basically you know, living off, uh, at best, whatever salary they get, they live in a little apartment. They probably don't get married. A lot of them don't have kids. And, um, you know, I guess they're perfect fodder for Zuckerberg's meta. <laughs> there is an argument to say that every society has inequality, every society has hierarchies, and this is a vital part of our capitalist free market system in order to drive competition, growth, innovation, what do you say to the argument that this is simply a natural display of the system working? Well, I'm, you know, I'm not particularly um, uh, convinced that you need to have an equal society. What you have to have is upward mobility. And that's what's, when you lose upward mobility, capitalism itself loses its credibility. I mean, every time you, you, you get more monopoly power, um, people look around and say, hey, what, what, do I, uh, what, what do I get out of capitalism? I mean, capitalism has to um, have a base in competition. And when competition disappears, I mean, I know I, I, I worked in a venture capital firm. I, I've, I've seen what, what happens when somebody has a great idea, but they're not part of the insider group. They don't, they don't get the blessing of, 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 the, of the proper bishops and oligarchs. And so they, you know, their only choice is to um, is, is to sell out or become, you know, servants of these large companies. You know, it's one of the people I I, I write about in the book. He says is like, you know, it, it's like being absorbed by the Borg in the Star Trek series. I mean, you just, you know, you have to sort of service them. So you know, capitalism without competition, capitalism without upward mobility, is a failed capitalism. And what we have now fails. Now, there's a huge industry, including people that I feel you know reasonably close to on some issues, who are going to justify inequality and 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 monopoly forever. Because you know what? That's where the money is. I mean, if you look at how much money the oligarchs are putting into the media, how much they're putting into uh, lobbying. I mean, Facebook has an enormous lobbying operation. Google practically camped inside the uh, Obama administration. Um, now, I think even, even Google can't save what's happening to Biden, but, but the bottom line is you have a, a, a class system that is more medieval than capitalistic. The beauty of capitalism, I, I covered Silicon Valley in the 70s and 80s. And yeah, there were companies rising and falling. There was tremendous competition. You take the disk drive industry. There was a time there was like 50 disk drive companies. Now it ended up being a smaller number, but that competition. Think about this. Microsoft now has a complete monopoly. 
when you have a complete monopoly, you don't have to have a better product. You just have to figure out how to fleece your customers better. So for instance, can anyone tell me that Microsoft uh, uh, today is better than it was 10 years ago? I don't see any change. In the 70s and 80s, when we had competitive capitalism, you, could, you couldn't keep up with the changes. They were happening so fast. Um, it was such an amazing culture. And by the way, it wasn't just Silicon Valley. It was, it was in Dallas, Fort Worth, and in Austin, and in Southern California, in the Boston area. Um, there were Orlando. There were many places where this was happening. Now, we have far less both geographic diversity in terms of where the companies are from. Because if you look at the leading... Uh, tech slash media companies that are virtually all either in the Bay Area or, um, or, or the Seattle, you know, the Puget Sound. So you've got a narrowing of, of things as opposed to an expansive capitalism. Um, you know, Lenin, um, you know, was a, like Marx, probably one of the more accurate or deep thinkers about capitalism. And he said, capitalism really has its heart in the village marketplace. It's it's the dream of the young person who says, hey, I'm gonna open up a food store on, on Tustin Avenue in Orange, California. Um, and, you know, but if that's not possible, then the whole allure of capitalism dies. Capitalism emerged out of feudalism, but it could end up creating a new version of feudalism. We recently hosted Steven Pinker on this podcast and I'm sure he would disagree with the bleak picture that you're painting of our society. He would say, over the last few decades, child mortality rates around the world have collapsed, poverty has collapsed, uh, we progressed in our medicine, in our science, in our technology, life expectancy is longer, people are living happier, healthier That's lives. Surely we're not in such a bleak situation as you're painting. We could be headed to the bleak, bleak situation. That's why I call it a warning to the middle class. Look, there have been, first of all, most of the enormous gains in the last few decades have, weren't in the West and they weren't in, in uh, the United States, they were in Asia predominantly. That's where the big improvements were. A lot of the technology that's caused this was technology we, we've had and is now diffused. But let's look at the last decade. The last decade, uh, life expectancy, um, particularly for working class whites in the United States has gone down. Um, the percentage of people who, who own houses, particularly under the age of 40, has gone down. The concentration of wealth has gotten much greater. Um, the, um, I, the health situation um, um, in the, um, much of the West is not in such great shape. Um, I mean, we were making enormous progress. I would say in many ways till the, till the 70s, maybe e even into the 90s. Um, but since then, as things consolidated, the growth rates have generally dropped. Um, the poverty rates um, have gotten, um, you know, somewhat higher. Um, there's, there's definitely um, uh, on the, on, you know, on the physical level. Just take a look. You know, sometimes I, I, I'd like to take these, you know, people who, you know, make lots of money by, by saying how wonderful everything is and why we should never challenge anything. You know, because you know, if you know, rich, you know, being rich makes you smart, and which it doesn't makes you rich. It doesn't make you smart necessarily. <laughs> but but I think that what what we do, it, you know, I would love to take these people and say, get in the car and let's go to the south side of Chicago. Let's go to these Midwestern manufacturing places. Let's go to the British Midlands. Let's go to 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 the the outskirts of Osaka. Let's go to all these places where this, this great uh, achievement hasn't taken place. The interesting thing about the wealthy today is that they can insulate themselves in ways that were not possible or not easy to do in the past. Um, you know, first of all, many times they run businesses where they have no unions and they have no working class constituency. So what do they care? In Silicon Valley, I'll give you a really interesting illustration. This is part of the story. 75% of the world workforce, the tech workforce in Silicon Valley is not American citizens. Now think about that. So Silicon Valley has all this growth. Then they said, well, how come 30% of the people who are residents of Silicon Valley need, need some form of welfare? Something isn't working in the system that we have. And if we don't deal with it, eventually the socialists will deal with it. 
Um, you know, I think this is the, the, the kind of insight that, you know, in British history, Disraeli, Churchill, for two, understood that if you did not provide a, a, a means of upward mobility and hope to the middle and working classes, in, in Britain, you would say the working classes. If you don't provide it, eventually they're going to say, well, why the hell should I care? For instance, let's say you're, you're a young person in, you know, in London and you say, hey, I have, um, I'm going to work really hard and I'm going to buy that house out in you know, Essex or someplace like that. And this is what I'm driving to do. If I know I have no chance ever of doing that, then I start caring about one thing, rent control because I have no stake in this system. And that's what's happening. What we're noticing, by the way, in the United States is those areas where there's high degrees of home ownership are vote now very, very differently than the places where there's very low home ownership. The lower the home ownership, the more, in quote, progressive the area is gonna be. I want to talk about this issue of housing later, and this is fascinating. I mean, I'm in the middle of it. I'm in London, I'm a young person. I wanna buy a house one mm. day. A lot of my income is going on rent and it seems uh, like a very difficult situation for many people. But it is. Before we get onto that, um, let's talk about some of the causes of why you think we've gone into this sort of stagnation and perhaps even leading to this kind of disaster, as I see it, as you're painting. Um, you say since the 1970s, 1970s, 1990s, perhaps this, is, this uh, trend has been going on. Why do you think it is? Is it globalization? Uh, is it mm. sort of, is, are we at sort of late stage capitalism? What's going on? Well, I think there are a lot of different causes. Um, one big cause obviously is globalization, as you mentioned, I think that, and, and, and particularly because the, this globalization has been dominated by an authoritarian system in China, which is, you know, which I, you know, basically parallel in many ways to the, the vision of the corporate state that uh, Mussolini had. I mean, I think Xi is, is more like Mussolini than, than like Lenin in many ways in terms of, you know, because he, you know, he's not trying to undermine hierarchy. Now, Lenin tried and it turned out to create a new hierarchy, but at least the, the, the intention wasn't this. So the globalization's played a big role. I think the, the replacement of capital, the, 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 you know, the, the fact that capital is now winning out over labor, I think that's a big part of it. Um, and I think that, and this is, you know, um, I don't know if they're still gabbing in Glasgow or not, but, uh, um, but, but basically the, the climate movement has become an enormously effective tool for the consolidation of power and, and for stagnated growth. The Great Reset, you read, what, what is the Great Reset? The Great Reset is Prince Charles gets, gets a, allowed to fly around in his private jet, but God, should that bus driver from, from North London, he better not go to Spain for the two weeks of the year that he gets. You know, oh, that's terrible. Um, you know, it's okay for, for people to, um, you know, for Jeff Bezos to have, you know, uh, spend millions of dollars on houses. I mean, to buy something that the Habsburgs would, would be impressed with. Um, meanwhile, we're going to tell young people like you that you're going to have to live in an apartment and continue to fund, you know, the city of London through your, through your hard earnings um, and have nothing for yourself. Now think about where this goes long-term. That means that young people, let's just say young people end up, uh, let's say here in the United States, we end up with 40% home ownership instead of 60 to 65%. Then one quarter of all women never have kids. So what kind of society are we talking about? We're talking about a society where people live in apartments, make minimal amounts of money, barely stay above, uh, above um you know, above water. And, and so what, you, what you're seeing is a demunition of aspiration. And to me, that's the worst thing of all. I mean, what I loved about, particularly when I first came to California in 1971, was the, was the opportunity to do something different, to reinvent yourself. That's not California today. I mean, yes, if I if I'm, if I'm an investor and I've got $50 million, maybe I can do something with it. But for the, for the, the Mexican guy who, you know, uh, worked in a machine shop in Los Angeles and then started his own machine shop, you see less and less and less of that. 
Um, and then during the pandemic, I just, because I think it's important, uh, this whole sector of, of Main Street and High Street businesses, you know, I'm, I know when I've been in you know, England quite a few times, um, you know, the, 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 you know, the Pakistani guy who sets up a little restaurant or, a, you know, here in, 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 in Orange County, California, where every two blocks there's a, a little taco stand owned by some family. Those businesses have been very hard hit. The chains have gotten stronger. We know what's happened to bookstores. Um, and so, you know, the opportunities for upward mobility uh, have become more and more constrained. And that means that you have to figure out how do you make a hierarchical society without upward mobility work? And therefore, neo-feudalism. Now, the solution is universal basic income. You know, you get $2,000 a month, uh, whether you work, whether you don't work, and you, uh, um, and you live on that and whatever sort of gig work you have. And, and that's, that's the world that, that, that uh, Silicon Valley has planned for us. So you talk about that world, and you also mentioned earlier this idea of owning nothing and renting everything. Is that where we're heading? And if so, what's so wrong with that? I mean, they would argue living in a property uh, in a sort of world without um, property ownership, that's not so bad. We can all go and live our lives and, and sort of live as these kind of free floating human beings spending money on what we want and, and uh, live quite happily. Well, OK, I'll, I'll give you a few examples. A, you figure out if you don't own anything, you're never going to have a house. You never you know, you're going to live in an apartment. You're probably not going to have kids. You're very likely not, uh, you know, be reluctant to get married. Um, Why? Can I just what? sorry interrupt you? Why on both those points? Well, the, book, the statistics will show you that people very often when they plan to have children, one of the first things they do is they buy a house because a house creates stability. Is it OK? We're going to be in this area for the next few years. The kids are going to go to this school. You know, um, you know, you're, particularly if you're going to what we would call public school in the United States, um, uh, you would it would be much more uh, people who live in communities where people are homeowners, much more stable, higher degree of, of political invo uh, um, involvement, better schools. I mean, there's a whole the um, Habitat for Humanity has done quite a bit of good work in this area. So, you know, that's one thing. The, the, the other thing is that when you remove the possibility of, of owning anything, then you never have any control. So all your life is now a relationship of you, the state on one side and capital on the other. And so you basically have the state party, which is labor or, um, in, in, the, in the UK or the progressive wing of the democratic party in the United States and, um, and the party of capital which is you know, still largely the Republican party here and the Tory party. Um, but you as an independent, as a person who can make up your own mind, um, that's becoming less and less possible. You, you're, you know, you're free floating, but, the, but you're floating on structures that, that the oligarchy has laid out for you. Does the internet and the rise of globalization, have they both had positives in some way for social mobility? For example, people can have access to almost unlimited information for a, a very small amount of money. They can travel freely throughout their own country, but also to other countries relatively easily at the moment. Maybe green people want to change that, as you mentioned earlier. Um, but does the rise of the internet and globalization have opportunities for people as well as downsides in order to, uh, in terms of social mobility? Oh, sure, it has both. I mean, and look, let's face it, globalization has created a middle class in China and in East Asia, and even now in India, that that's a great accomplishment of globalization. So that's certainly a positive. Um, the internet also a lot of positives. Um, here are the negatives. As the economy is dominated by China, we now have a essentially a, I would say more fascist than communist, but a, but a authoritarian state that can shut our economies down anytime it wants. Um, you know, I remember during the pandemic, you, you couldn't get a mask in the beginning. Um, fortunately for me, a friend of mine who's Chinese happens to be teaching in, in the UK, emailed her cousin in Shenzhen and the next day we got a big shipment of, of masks, which I then gave out to my entire family and friends. 
you, you don't want to be in that situation. Um, um, and, and, and increasingly we're seeing this whole supply chain thing. You can't get this, you can't get that because, you know, in some cases, because China can't do it. And in some cases, because China doesn't want to do it. The Europeans think about them and their dependence on Putin. So there's, there's certainly, you know, negatives of, of globalization that have taken place. Similarly with the internet, great thing. I've covered it. I've written about it. I've worked on it. And you're right. We have um, unlimited access to information, but now as it's been not become monopolized increasingly by a small number of platforms, we now see major censorship. I, you know, for instance, thinking about the climate issue, there are lots of different ways to apply the climate issue. I'm not talking about, you know, just sort of, oh, no, no, nothing's happening. It's a hoax. I'm talking about Steve Coonan, who was advisor to President Obama. I'm talking about Mike Schellenberger, a longtime environmentalist, you know, Bjorn Lomborg. These are serious people. They, the, the digital media now puts these people in what I call, what I, what I call the digital gulag. It, it's not even where we're going to challenge your views. We're going to act like they don't exist. We saw this with the pandemic. So when you have five, 10 companies controlling it, and of those companies, almost all have the same ideology, support the same political party, have the same... Uh, worldview, have the same cultural opinions, and now they actually think that they should, they should be able to um, uh, essentially force us to see only one type of media. I think this is pretty scary. The, the difference between US and China is the autocrats in China are in the Communist Party and the autocrats in America are in Silicon Valley. It's not just the uh, oligopolies though, is it, that you talk about. You also talk about the sort of clergy uh, you describe these people as the political and cultural elites, the people who right. work in the media, the people who work in government, and of course in the tech oligopolies. But but just let's focus on those people who work in the media, the government, the kind of uh, the elites uh, of of the West. You say that, the, and in education, that's another important area. You say that they all hold a very similar opinion, a woke opinion or a progressive opinion, and that it's getting a lot worse. The gap, the cultural gap between the elites and the working and middle classes are, is growing every day. You've seen the rise of populism, that's probably a good example or an outcome of that. Can you describe or these Brexit. elites? Or, and Brexit, as a fantastic example. So can you describe these cultural and political elites and what's going on here? Right, well, well one of the things is that we've become very um, into this credentialism. In other words, you know, a, a job that would have been perfectly good for a high school graduate. Now you need a college degree for no apparent reason. It's just that you, you know, there we have such a surplus of college graduates. We can we can make it harder for the for the high school graduate. So credentialism is part of it. Then um, it's it's what uh, Gramsci talked about the march through the institutions. While conservatives uh, and and uh, people who are apolitical went out to make money and figure out ways to to survive, um, the 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 universities became increasingly dominated by a particular ideology. And once that ideology came in, then they sort of cloned themselves in the new appointments. So if you look at any of the surveys of the opinions of the academics and and the media, which is in many ways, an adjunct of academia in many ways. Um, what you see is incredible levels of, of, of uh, homogeneity. I mean, in some cases, 110 to one, you know, I mean, it's like, I, I mean, today to be a, a, even a moderate liberal or an old fashioned social Democrat, like I would see myself, um, and if, if you were at a university, you would be in a tiny minority. And what I find is that a lot of young people who, who understand what I'm saying and uh, write to me and all that, they're afraid to say anything. And that's another thing you see. Young people, it's not that young people are all crazy, is that they're scared. That if I say the wrong things, everybody I know who teaches is terrified that someday they're going to say something that's going to be taken out of context and and they will be you know, punished for it. Now, my school, fortunately, we haven't done that, but it's happening to people all over the country. And 
And so what you have is the growth of a uniform theology, if you will, although it's not religious. So the outcome of this is really interesting. Is it a problem where conservatives or people with, let's say, moderate values like yourself, if they want to elect a politician as prime minister or a president who holds those same beliefs, let's say Donald Trump or whoever, for just as an example, uh, and Donald Trump tries to implement his platform, his policy platform, but he stopped because the cultural and political elites within the government, within the universities, within the media, completely disagrees even within the military, completely disagrees with his outlook, which may be shared by millions of Americans who voted for him. Uh, that means that there is a democratic deficit, and surely that simply leads to resentment and anger from many, many people who feel that even if they vote for politicians who agree with them, they can't get uh, stuff done. They can't get the stuff done because uh, it doesn't matter who they vote for, the, the people in these institutions will remain the same. Trump, of course, is a complicated topic. You know, I mean, he's a despicable human being, you know, basically. So that that never helps, um, although it maybe helped him get ahead. But, but on, the, on, on the other hand, many of the issues that Trump brought out were widely popular. I mean, the what we're seeing on the border today is, you know, exactly what Trump might have talked about. Now, I don't necessarily agree with his views on immigration or the right wing on immigration. But the control of the border is is a is a big deal, and and I'm sure many voters who care about that, and and including by the way a lot of Latino voters in South Texas, and in Southern Arizona and New Mexico, are saying, hey, this isn't uh, this is really bad. Now, oddly enough, one of the reasons we don't have it as much in California is there's a wall, <laughs> but that's another story. Um, so I think what they find, I think they're that you're right. I mean, they they look at 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 the political class, they don't care about that. So, and, and a great example, which is very au courant, is the, um, the Virginia elections, where um, basically the, the education establishment's um, uh, addiction to sort of racial um, education, you know, sort of, a, sort of Jim Crow in, in reverse, um, ended up losing them the election. Um, in Minneapolis, the defunding of the police, an idiotic idea that, you know, only, only an intellectual could possibly think is a good idea. Um, the, uh, was voted down in Minneapolis overwhelmingly and more by the African-American population than by the white population. So there is this gap, even among the minorities. That's why we're seeing my, my, the recent information I've seen is Youngkin got 40% of the Hispanic vote in, um, uh, in, in Virginia, because you know what? Most immigrants um, are more culturally conservative, than, and I think this is true in the UK as well, than, than most whites. Is it not the case as well that we could be heading to a situation where there is a backlash, and you're, you're seeing, you're, you're describing that now, um, but not just in politics, but in the universities and in wider society, when young people see a mainstream group of people, for example, the people running, you know, the lecturers or the cultural elites, the woke people that you've been talking about, when they see that, uh, that elite, their tendency surely is to rebel against that. So that might be something to be hopeful about. Yes, I, and, 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 there's, and, and let's, let's, let's talk about some things that we can feel hopeful about. One, we see that the Z generation, the post-millennials, are much less interested in thought control than the millennials were from what the, some of the polling is saying. Minorities are not behaving the way that the progressives think they should, they, you know, a lot, they, they, they wanna own a business, they wanna own a house, they wanna, um, they wanna do well for their families. They don't want, you know, their, their kids to learn a, at, at, at age six about transgenderism. You know, it's hard enough being a kid trying to figure out what to do without throwing this at them. Now, look, if somebody decides to go transgender, that they have that right, and you know, they, you know, they certainly have certain uh, rights to, you know, to being treated well and all that. But, but the reality is that that people are not behaving the way they should be behaving according to the woke ideology. Working class people understand that 
a lot of the green agenda, for instance, is going to destroy their jobs. I mean, so you get this incredible backlash. You know, we now the following this one race in New Jersey where a, a Republican truck driver uh, may very well have beaten the, one of the leaders of the Democratic Party in the, in the New Jersey legislature. He's a, a Republican truck driver. I mean, we're seeing in, in, um, <coughs> in Virginia, a Haitian, uh, I mean, a West Indian immigrant coming um, lieutenant governor, a, um, a person from, uh, whose family is from Cuba becoming attorney general. We're starting to see a change. You know, if you get the, the Asian, Hispanic, um, and, and African-American populations voting 30, 40% Republican, the game is over. And the other thing is, you know, I, I'm, I've been reading this Churchill biography, so I, I guess, you know, you know, trust the people. But the people don't believe in this crap. The percentage of people who buy into the woke agenda, now that's not I'm not talking about social democratic agenda. I'm talking about the woke agenda, which is basically cultural, is about 8% of the population. But they're very heavily populated in certain places. You know, my, my brother lives in New York and he gets the New York Times. He's very, very liberal, a Bernie Sanders supporter. But he always says to me, I said, I, I, I pick up the newspaper. There's never anything about where I live, Westchester County. There's... There, all the cultural stuff is, you know, I'll never see a white male under the age of 70 on the front page of the, of, the, of the art section. Well, you know, artistic genius comes in every color and every sex and every, you know, uh, every ethnic group. And, and, but it's all, like we sort of are having what one might almost call affirmative action history. We, we, we move history to fit our current point of view even if it's completely inaccurate. And of course, the, the great example of this was the 1619 project that the New York Times pushed, um, which was ahistorical. Yeah, I mean, it's not that slavery didn't exist, but most of the, of the United States, and certainly by 1860, was not dependent on slavery. Um, and um, as I recall, um, I think the North did win that war pretty convincingly, um, you know, because it was much more advanced, it was industrial, and it was free labor that beat slave labor. Um, and we ought to celebrate that as a great accomplishment, not say, oh, well, American history is terrible. We think about 600,000 young people, mostly young people died in the Civil War. Um, you know, we ought to celebrate that, you know, the insanity of tearing down Frederick Ch uh, Douglass and, and Ulysses Grant statues. You sit there and say, what are you thinking? And Abraham so, Lincoln, so of I course. Think this, excuse me? And Abraham Lincoln statue, of course. Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about, you have to have a usable culture to hold the society together, particularly when that society, as in, is the case in the UK as well, and in France, are becoming ever more diverse. There has to be a common mythology. It doesn't have to be the same mythology that may have been taught in England in 1900, but it has to say, you know, you should be proud of being English. You know, I mean, when I think about the fact that Yale is now allowing people to, um, to get degrees in English without studying Shakespeare, I, I, I said, well, wait a minute. You know, my daughter performed Shakespeare, right? she's an actress. I said, how, how, can, how can you teach, have any literacy in English if you have not read Shakespeare. I mean, the guy basically invented the language if he didn't, Chaucer did. I mean, this is where English comes from. How can you study English? Or how do you study math and say, well, it's all racist, but besides the fact that, it, that a lot of it was invented by the Arabs. You know, you, you, you sit there and you say, how do you take all the beauty of, our, of the last thousand years and throw it into, into the dustbin of history and, and recreate a completely artificial history to replace it. Well, that is what postmodernism is, basically. Uh, can you describe your solution to these problems that we've been talking about? How do we reverse these trends towards neo-feudalism? And is it possible to do so? Well, I, I have to believe it's possible. I've got two young girls, uh, daughters, who uh, I don't want them to grow up in a dystopia. Um, I mean, I grew up in, particularly in California, the last 50 years. You know, you have to feel very blessed to have been here. And, you know, there are some negatives, but, 
you know, it's it's been a tremendous, uh, tremendously economic economic uh, uh, aspect, and 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 you know, many you know, great things. But how do we? How do my kids or you or you, if you ever have kids, um, how do we? How do we do that? I think the first thing is there has to be pushback. And I think what you mentioned with Virginia, we're seeing pushback. Not necessarily pushback against liberal democracy a la Roosevelt or Truman or, or Bill Clinton for that matter. But what we have is a, um, a rejection against the cultural revolution that's being imposed on people. And it's happening. And my, my, uh, the other sense is, oh, in the longer run, because the progressives don't tend to have kids very often, um, the, um, in the long run, the more religious people will probably win out, as Eric, Eric Kaufman's written about, you know, the, uh, you know the, the religious will inherit the earth. You know, my, my Muslim friend with six kids and my San Francisco friend with no kids, well, I sort of can figure it out. So, it's this period now is going to be very critical. But the good thing is human beings are not as stupid as um, the progressives hope they are, not as easy to be manipulated. Oh, people will say, oh, I'm worried about climate change. Oh, OK. Um, you want to give up your car? Um, oh, I'm worried about climate change. Oh, well, get out of that house and move into a little apartment. I, I think when you try to, to impose this ideology, or, or let's give it this way, here's my daughter um my youngest daughter um the the uh, you know the granddaughter of holocaust survivors being told that that she's a guilty white male you know, of wh white female racist because and and sh she should be discriminated against in school for you know because she happened to have been born with 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 what i guess now um the gentiles consider caucasians i guess you know some that wasn't the case in the past um, but the reality is, you know, if you take an Asian parent and you're told you, you're not going to have, um, you can't have uh, AP, you know, advanced placement calculus because it's racist. Well, I'm a Chinese parent. I moved to California so that my kid can live in Irvine and get a great job and go to a great school and use their, their hard work. We start undermining those things. I think there's going to be pushback. And what, I, what I'm very excited about is not just the pushback from the right, which was expected. It's the pushback from the center and even parts of the left. You think of the people who have now left the progressive uh, journalism world, you know, um, you know, people like Barry Weiss or Andrew Sullivan or, you know, or Glenn Greenwald. I mean, there's a bunch of them, uh, Matt Eby. And these are people coming from the left. And say this doesn't make any sense. This is terribly against the interests of middle and working class people. So I think the pushback's there. The, the big question is: Will the tech oligarchs and their Wall Street backers be able to silence the dissent enough so that um, it it never achieves the the numbers it has? Um, and um, I don't know. I mean, but I you know I think you know it's like you know, uh, it's like, you know, people like Barrington Moore said, you know, no bourgeois, no democracy. You wipe out that class. We are an authoritarian society. Maybe every four years we elect a new dictator, you know, but that's about it. So do you see a sort of counter revolution coming? Yes. There, the question is, what's the shape of that counter revolution? What I've been hoping to do is to unite some of the conservatives with some of the liberals and say, on these issues, we agree. You know, one of the things I've noticed, and, you know, my book did really well, you know, it was predominantly because of the conservative, you know, good exposure to conservative media. But in the past, when I would do a book, I would do NPR, I would do interviews with major newspapers. This time, I was astounded that all of a sudden, places like I used to do CNN, MSNBC, I did, my views haven't changed. My book is more left than right, I think, you know, certainly. Um, but if you don't follow the party line, you are you can't even be part of the debate. So the question is this: Can they put enough of us in the digital cornfield or the digital gulag long enough so that nobody will even know what our arguments are? 
I think you were getting slightly too optimistic then and to, uh, <laughs> to, to put people on to a, uh, a darker note to end the interview because this is a very dark interview. I wanted to uh, quote one of your uh, most recent articles and you mention uh, the differences between Britain and America. Right. So you say, fortunately America is not England, now a sh shadow of its uh, industrial country living off its imperial connections to bolster its media, finance and tourism sectors. It's a small country at the edge of a fading continent in a seemingly, in seemingly permanent decline. It lacks our vast ex uh, expanse of agricultural energy and other resources, not to mention our still considerable entrepreneurial spirit. Is Britain basically doomed then? Shall I go off to, uh, to no, America? I, I, no, I don't. I, I don't think Britain is doomed in a world where America and Australia and Canada, all of whom look to England for many things, um, as long as the world is not a Chinese dominated world, I think England would, could find a, a, a good place in that. I think Europe is making enormous mistake trying to, you know, particularly the Germans, you know, um, to, you know, sort of play ball with Putin and, and Xi and think that, you know, they're going to win out. They're not going to win out. You, you think any of those German industries are going to exist in 20 years? I don't think so. I think most of them are going to be Chinese, you know, under the current circumstances. So in a part, saving the UK requires the restoration of the of or the creation of an alliance of people who have basic democratic values. Um, you know, today you can include Japan, South Korea, Australia, India, um, and certainly the U.S., Canada, um, um, and um, Australia. The you know the the you know these countries. We have to reconstitute some sort of system where these democratic countries um, um, have um, a pushback. Because if in the year 2050, this world economy is dominated by China, financially, industrially, technologically, all of which is possible, then the UK will end up the way I described it. Um, because ultimately the, the, the Chinese are gonna look at the UK, oh, what a, I think maybe I'll buy one of those lovely country estates in, in, in the beautiful countryside of, of England. Um, you know, but that's all I want from it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna buy a car made in England. I'm not gonna buy a refrigerator made in England. I'm not gonna buy a software program concocted in England. The, 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 the English, are, they're, they're really good actors. Um, and, um, and so maybe, maybe we'll let them be our jesters. They'll, they'll be good for that too. On that lovely note, um, <laughs> we're, going to, we're going to end. Thank you so much, Joel, for joining us. That was fascinating. I, I, I hope that, you know, more than anything else, I just want to leave with this one. We still have not lost this, this battle. We still can see a restoration of the middle class and, and a restoration of, of democracy. I, it's still possible, but we better wake up to the realities. Thank you so much. All right. Okay.